We finally made it. We get to talk about the show from which my least favorite intro comes from. Since you can read, you know we're going to talk about Tales from the Dark Side. After the release of Creepshow, folks were eager to see if an anthology TV series could happen. Unfortunately, due to the good old WB owning certain aspects of Creepshow, the series could not move forward with the same name. The producers of Creepshow, Laurel Entertainment, decided to carry the torch with help from series creator George Romero to create Tales from the Dark Side. And I think we all know George pretty well here. The series would drift between the genres of horror, science fiction, and fantasy with a little dark humor mixed in at times. There would also be a twist ending in each of the episodes. The show was successful when it did launch due to its late night time slot and lower budget. Shows like Amazing Stories and Alfred Hitchcock Presents had huge budgets then managed to crash after a few seasons. Both of those shows were great in their own right, but having that nightly time slot made it more accessible to the type of fan that it needed to attract. Basically, all of us horror lovers. We were weird and stayed up late at night just waiting for our comfort shows. Cause it's better to watch Tales at 10 rather than at seven. Yep, we're gonna, we're gonna start with the intro. After watching it, the effect doesn't hit me quite the same way it used to, but the transition between daytime and a peaceful field, the same image then only turning negative with that damn music just makes my heart stop. Man lives in the sunlit world of what he believes to be reality. The narration for the intro written by Romero and spoken by Paul Sparer, who needs an award for that foreboding delivery. I'm gonna spew just thinking about it. Uh, now I'm traumatized again. The episodes themselves may not have actors that are Tales from the Crypt caliber. You know, Christian Slater. They also had Romero and then Tom freaking Savini assisting in their practical effects department. Was every episode of the series great? But then when you think about it, was every episode of our favorite horror anthologies a 10? Eh, probably not. There was also a great amount of care that went into making the series from the writers and the stories to the effects. Everyone on that team wanted to deliver a show that will linger in the minds of their viewers. Here we are with our favorite episodes. Inside the Closet. When you see this is written by Michael McDowell with direction from the one and only Tom Savini, you know something worthy is coming. The premise revolves around a graduate student named Gail who is looking for a room to rent. The only one she happens to find is in the home of the strict Dr. Finner. Gail is good with the rules set by the doc. No TV, radio, or boyfriends. She also needs to be super quiet. So there's no television, no stereo, and no boyfriends trooping through at all hours of the night. Uh, seems a little excessive, but if you need a place, then you need a place. Dr. Finner tells her the room she is renting used to be his daughter's. Upon inspection of the room, Gail points out a rather small closet. Dr. Finner tells her that if she needs to use a closet, then to use the one downstairs, that the closet in her room is locked with no key to open it. Of course, this makes Gail curious, as it would literally anyone. That night, she swears she hears noises in the room. Okay, tiny locked closet, scampering in the room. What do we have on our hands? Mogwai? Critter? Ghoulie? What you have is a naked little demon baby. Poor Gail gets dragged into the closet and eaten by the weird naked demon baby creature. Curiosity killed the cat, well, the college girl in this instance. The end is pretty great. The twist is revealed, but not entirely. After the creature nibbles at his foot, he picks it up and starts loving all over it. We deduce from the interaction that the creature is most likely his daughter or replacement daughter? What's eerie about the episode aside from the creature itself is the fact that we have no idea what the doctor's motivations are. Is he crazy? Is it grief motivated? We'll never know. The False Prophet. I have been waiting for God knows how long to talk about this episode to anyone. So do you get this strange feeling when you watch this episode like you've seen it before? Maybe it's pure coincidence, but I feel like I'm watching the inspiration for Garth Ennis's Preacher. The two main characters greatly resemble Jesse Custer and Tulip O'Hare. The main character, Cassie, is played by Ronnie Blakely, who you know best as Nancy's drunk mom, Marge from Nightmare on Elm Street. Here, she's just a southern girl with big hair following the advice of a psychic who tells her she will find love in Texas. Another preacher flag. This is a rather bizarre episode. Cassie spends most of her time at a bus stop talking to a sentient booth that can tell the future called Horus X. While waiting for the Sagittarian love of her life, a smooth talking preacher wearing snakeskin boots walks into the station. He thinks they're meant to be after about 60 seconds and proceeds to grope on her. What's really weird is that Horus X is getting all jealous and horny. No, 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 you don't understand. It's really weird. 
And that's exactly what I like about this episode besides the preacher similarities. I don't really know what's happening or really what the writer intended. Hey, Larry, can you please give me a shout? Errol will give you my details. Sorry, right number. This gem was written by Stephen King and immediately reflects as the story begins. The episode opens with a woman named Deborah talking on the phone with her friend. They're just yakking about mom stuff. You know, kids, husbands, deli meat, potpourri. When another call comes in on the other line, Deborah clicks over and immediately hears the painful cries of another woman on the other end of the line. Deborah immediately thinks this is her daughter, Polly, calling from college about how miserable she is. Please, take. Polly, is that you? Honey, it's mom. <gasps> Deborah's husband, a well known horror writer named Bill, hint, hint, is listening and tries to help her out to find out who made the call. As all this is happening, the younger children come into the kitchen to find out if everything's okay. And the son wants to know if dad remembered to record the movie based on his book, Spider's Kiss. Deborah goes through all of her female family members, swearing it was someone who was kin to her. The last one she tries, her older sister Dawn, has a busy line. Bill calls the operator to see if they can break through, but the operator says the phone is off the hook. Frantic Deborah tells Bill she needs to go to Dawn's house in the middle of the boonies. He takes her and long story short, Dawn was passed out with her Walkman on with the phone slightly off the hook. Bill and Deborah go back home. Bill tells Deborah to let it go and tells her that he will come up to bed after the movie's over. The movie is the Romero classic, Dawn of the Dead, under the guise of being Spider's Kiss. The camera focuses on the clock, which jumps from midnight to 2 a.m. Deborah walks in the room and finds what she thinks is Bill sleeping and is actually Bill taking the long sleep. Yep, he's dead. Fast forward 10 years later and Deborah is writing a letter at Bill's desk. They're in the home for Polly's wedding and before Deborah goes back to the festivities, she rifles to the desk for a stamp. When she does, she finds the VHS of Spider's Kiss that Bill was taping for their youngest son. I'm ridding myself for some ring shit at this point, but who knows? She pops the tape in and the memories of that fateful evening flood through her. This triggers her to get on the phone and call the old house number crying desperately into the phone to save Bill and take him to the hospital. And there you have it. She was trying to warn herself in the past to stop the impending from happening. Most of us who have lost someone we love wish we could do this, but I think the story proves that the inevitable is bound to happen. The last car. While many of the episodes air on the quirky side, this one is genuinely creepy. Who's was leaving college for Thanksgiving to visit her family and meet up with her boyfriend. She catches what she assumes to be the correct train going to where her family lives. When she gets on, things are immediately off. There's only three people on the train, a bald man in a suit, a kid dressed up as a cowboy, and a nice little old lady. The little old lady greets Stacy, making perfectly normal small conversation until the lady asks what the object is on Stacy's wrist. It's a watch. Immediately my brain starts to wonder, does this lady have amnesia? As time goes on, it really goes on for Stacy, who feels like the mere minutes she spent on the train actually feel like hours, or maybe days. The old lady keeps mentioning the tunnels along the way. After running for a bit, the kid yells out that the tunnel is coming, and the old lady starts to go catatonic. Stacy looks out the window, and when she does, she sees her own reflection, but it's not her reflection. It's this eerie portrait of herself pulling down the shade. Stacy becomes more paranoid as time goes on, and eventually the conductor shows up to take her ticket. She tells him she has no ticket. Just throw her off, or at least let her come to the front of the train. He tells her there's no going between trains that are in motion, and eventually she gives in and hands off her ticket. However, once he gives it back, she mentions the ticket he gave her was one way, and hers was round trip. He replies, telling her it's the only one that he got. When he comes back through the door, another tunnel comes. Stacy desperately tries to get through, but the minute the next tunnel begins, things start to come to the surface. She looks through to the other side, once black now reveals the conductor as a long-worn skeleton. There's actually a quote from Beetlejuice that Barbara says that would sum this up perfectly. Are we halfway to heaven? Are we halfway to hell? How long is this gonna last? The consensus on this episode is that Stacy is in hell. It could also be said that Stacy is unaccepting and that she's actually dead, but in the end succumbs to the fact. Honestly, it could be both. She could have died and been in limbo, then is forced to live every day, and this version of could be what hell is to her. The Geese and Stacks. Dollhouses and dolls are creepy in any context when it comes to the horror genre. These are hands down some of the most horrifying dolls I have ever seen in my life. Even the dad comments upon first seeing the dolls that they are weird and ugly. If I saw those in my house, I would immediately take them outside and light them on fire. When you see dolls that look like that, you do not hesitate to take action no matter how severe it seems. Okay guys, we've run through these scenarios before. Annabelle, Chucky, dolls, Puppet Master, yes it counts, and the Chili Bandit. No, wait, anyway. We do not take any chances no matter how adorable they are. 
Though they never really seem to be, huh? As I said before, these dolls were a gift from Uncle Richard, left behind from a tenant in a home that he's recently leased. His niece is automatically taken with the dolls and spends most of her time sitting with them crafting stories. Well, that's what it seems like anyway. Audrey's father, Sam, noticed that the stories Audrey tells about the dolls parallel what's going on in their own home. The dolls start talking about a dress, mom comes home with a dress, dad gets sick, the dolls were sick, and so on. The echoing of events becomes more and more than a coincidence, and Sam tries to convince his family that the dolls in the dollhouse need to go. As to be expected, no one believes him, and once we think that things have cooled, they take a turn. The next morning, Uncle Richard comes to check on the family. This wakes Sam up, but there's something odd about Richard's voice. It's loud and distorted. Sam? Yeah. The room begins to shake. Then Richard hears Sam and his wife crying out in the direction of the dollhouse. Richard approaches the dollhouse, falls to his knees, and cries out as he realizes that the family has now taken residence inside of the dollhouse. The final scene cuts to a new real estate agent in the home. She sees the dollhouse in the corner of the room and goes to check what's inside. When she opens it, she sees Richard in doll form on the floor in the front room besides a miniature version of the dollhouse. And upstairs, we see that Sam and his family are now dolls too. The Creepshow series on Shudder actually has a pretty rad episode called The House of the Head that involves a family tormented by a dollhouse. I recommend that one as well if you haven't seen it yet. So where can you watch Tales from the Dark Side at this point? As of right now, your best bet is to get the series on DVD. There's a few episodes on YouTube, but they're total potato quality. Here's hoping that Shudder picks it back up, or maybe Prime. How it ended. Once Tales wrapped in July of 88, Richard P. Rubenstein, who served as a producer on the series, jumped over to another favorite anthology series, Monsters. Less terrifying intro on that one. Anytime I mention this one to folks, that's exactly what they talk about. That one is on my list to cover, so we'll get there. Oh yes, we will get there. Monsters dove directly into horror, whereas Tales would enter the sci-fi and fantasy realms on occasion. A fairly successful movie adaptation came out in 1990, which had a bit of a different formula. Instead of going the straight anthology route, there was a main story weave throughout. We watched that a ton when I was a kid. Cat from Hell was always my favorite of the tales. The cat going into William Hickey's mouth is permanently embedded into my brain. There was an attempt to reboot the series in 2013 with Joe Hill, Roberto Orsi, and Alex Kurtzman developing. In 2014, Joe Hill announced that he would be creative director for the show, which at the time was just titled Dark Side. The series was planned for the CW, and Dark Side seems like the perfect name for a CW show. Edgy. Hill wanted Dark Side to be more like the movie and have a tie between the stories. He said that in a world post The X-Files that a usual anthology show wouldn't work. I don't necessarily agree with that statement, but I'm also a diehard anthology fan, so there's that. I believe if you get the right people together, it can happen. Like a horror field of dreams or something. Anyway, like I said, I, I like Joe, so I'm sure whatever vision he had was worth a watch. In 2015, the show was given a pilot order and started filming in March and wrapped in April. They even reverted back to the old name. Sadly, after all of this, CW wound up passing on the series as did other networks. Hill's vision eventually went to a graphic novel published by IDW. Tales from the Dark Side lives on in the hearts and minds of kids who grew up during the 80s and 90s. When this one is brought up, we trade stories and see which one tops which, and who was terrorized the most. I have to thank George Romero for championing the anthology and always delivering the goods. Until next time, my fiendish friends. The anthology film is most certainly a flawed genre for horror, but you know what? It's also 100% one of my all-time favorites. Most of the time, anthologies are pieced together from various short stories with anywhere from three to six mini films woven together, though it can just be split into two or even stretched into more segments. There's also typically a wraparound story that has some sort of relation to the other tales, even if it's just done in a minimalist way, like how beautifully the first VHS film did it, with someone discovering the tapes with the stories they're in. These anthology films are also sometimes called portmanteau films, and while they aren't all expressly horror, they have lived in that realm for the longest and certainly had the biggest impact there. Some of my personal favorites are from the studio Amicus, who has a rival to Hammer, and excelled at these type of movies. Tales from the Crypt and Vault of Horror were staples for me growing up, and I fondly revisit them today. There are just way too many to name, and even just rattling off all the good ones is a Herculean task. But for those interested, check out Severin Film's amazing documentary Tales of the Uncanny for the definitive look at the subgenre. Nice hearing from you, Carlos! I want to thank you guys for watching Revisited, and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click the bell so you can get notified each time a new video goes up. Now, back to the show. Now, is Tales from the Dark Side the best anthology film of all time? In a word, no. It does, however, cover a very few important bases. 
First and foremost, it is one of the few TV shows that got a theatrically released movie that may actually be better than the show. The show Tales from the Dark Side was the brainchild of George A. Romero, who in 1982 gave us one of the absolute best anthology films of all time with Creepshow. Creepshow would do the reverse of what we discussed and get a TV show after its movie. Well after, in fact. And while it also had two sequels, three is so terrible that this film is widely considered a sort of Creepshow 3. Anyway, Tales from the Dark Side the show ran for four years, is easily available on an inexpensive DVD set, and has the only opening credits theme that still gives me both the heebies and the jeebies. I'll let my favorite reminiscer of all shows horror, Nikki, take you through the television iteration on our Horror TV Shows We Miss episode on it. Another unique thing about this movie is that very rarely are all the stories in an anthology movie good. Now you could say that it only has three stories plus the wraparound, and that gives it less stories to end up bad, but I say that means you have to really nail the three you got. They start with the writing. All three stories have a certain pedigree going. Lot 249 is adapted from a short story from Sherlock Holmes creator Arthur Conan Doyle by Michael McDowell, who is a well-traveled scribe himself. Short episodes of the Dark Side TV series, as well as other popular 80s and 90s anthology shows like Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Amazing Stories, Tales from the Crypt, and Monsters. He also wrote the story for Beetlejuice and Stephen King's Thinner. McDowell would also pen the third segment, Lover's Vow, but sadly would pass away in 1999 at the age of 49. The middle segment comes from the two heavyweights of the film, with Stephen King having the original short story, The Cat from Hell, adapted by his good friend George Romero. Not only was this a return home of sorts for Romero, with him coming back to the series he created, while also reuniting with King for an anthology for the first time since the previously mentioned classic Creepshow. Add in K and B, who worked on the effects, and the family tree goes even deeper with parts of this team doing projects for Romero, or their teachers like Savini doing the effects for the original Creepshow. I don't know how else to say this is the true third film. The director was another journeyman in John Harrison. Harrison also floated around anthology shows like Tales from the Dark Side and Tales from the Crypt, while also directing the Dune miniseries in 2000. While he doesn't have a long list of work, his most recent credits are six episodes of, what do you know, the Creepshow TV series. His direction in the film does a good job of walking a fine line between TV series and movie, while having the perfect amount of high-level production value that had a sheen to the movie exactly what the show deserved but could never afford. The talent in front of the camera is a mix of, at the time, veteran and popular actors, with some up-and-comers that would have careers 30 years after the initial release. Lot 249 has Christian Slater and an incredibly young Julianne Moore as siblings, with Steve Buscemi as a rival student at college who has the hots for Moore. The main story revolves around Moore's boyfriend getting Buscemi in trouble long enough for him to lose an important credential at the college. Buscemi has an eye for antiques, and Lot 249 has a special guest that he will use to enact his revenge. Oftentimes in the show, the episodes would have a twist, or certain characters would meet their end from a special comeuppance, but the movie has a much bigger budget and wanted to earn its R rating. The effects from K and B shine throughout the entire film, but their work in this segment is what stands out the most to me, and vibe most with the style that they're going for. At its heart, along with Tales from the Crypt and Creepshow, this is a modern iteration of the old EC comics so many of these creators grew up loving and attempting to hide from their parents. In those, as in the segments here, the deaths were just brutal. In Lot 249, one of the characters gets their brain pulled out through his nose with a coat hanger, while another gets slashed open and stuffed with flowers and spices. Both of these events are set up by another character when explaining that this stuff happened during the mummification. This story also ends the most like one of these comics, with Christian Slater's character getting killed off screen after he thinks he has won, only to realize he was tricked by the story's true villain. Mess with a history nerd at your own risk. Couldn't distinguish a third dynasty sacred scroll from a piece of post-Alexandrine pictogram horn. The second story may lack the star power, but it has some fun and nuanced, at least at first, performances from William Hickey and David Johansson. Johansson may be better known as Buster Poindexter. And lead singer of the New York Dolls, with his most remembered performance probably being the ghost of Christmas past from the best version of Christmas Carol, Scrooged. Your mileage may vary, as the man has acted in a ton of stuff, but that's where he always stood out to me. William Hickey is another name that you may not know off the top of your head, but you've seen the face and heard the voice. I knew him growing up as Carlton Blanchard from Wings of All Things, but I think the consensus would almost certainly be Lewis from Christmas Vacation. They want you to say the blessing or the voice of the evil scientist in A Nightmare Before Christmas. The two are able to make a simple premise, out of a 12-page short story no less, a fun and engaging killer cat story that does not end well for either man. The special effects here are again top-notch, particularly with the show-stopping cat ingestion scene. Johansson, for his part, starts off as a cool and collected hitman, 
but very quickly falls apart emotionally as his attempts continue to fail, and the demon cat slowly chips away at him both physically and mentally. It feels every bit as brief as the 12-page short story it's based on, but still is also able to take up its third or so of the movie. It would also have fit really well into an interesting 70s anthology all about various cats called The Uncanny. The third and final story has an interesting take on love and promises, with 80s regulars Radon Chong and Dexter's dad and warrior alumni James Remar. Remar is a struggling artist who witnesses a gargoyle-type monster murder someone before he runs into a woman who changes his life in more ways than one. While the overall story here is a tad generic, it fits in perfectly with the feel of the other two and shows gore and other effects in just the right ways. While my least favorite of the three stories, it probably has the most heart and the best acting of the bunch. The wraparound is harmless enough and almost feels right out of the TV show with the strange pairing of Debbie Harry as the witch and a young Matthew Lawrence as a stand-in for Hansel about to be eaten. He reads her the stories out of the book called, well, Tales from the Dark Side, to buy time and is the only character that gets a happy ending. Don't you just love happy endings? The movie did well enough, taking in $16 million on a $3.5 million budget, while also getting about as middle-of-the-pack reviews as you can get, with a C average and 43% on Rotten Tomatoes. I think that's low by about 20%, but it's not a ton of reviews behind it either. There were actually plans for a sequel that was greenlit in October of 1990, just about five months after the release of the first film, but it eventually fell through. A shame, really, as the writer of the first and last story had already written a screenplay with George Romero again, this time based off a story by Robert Block of Psycho fame, and another two stories from Stephen King, Pinfall and Rainy Season. The movie is currently available on HBO Max, as well as YouTube or Prime for a fee, or, if you're a physical media nut like most of us horror fans are, you can pick up the Bare Bones DVD for about 5 bucks. The best way to experience this movie is with the still-in-print Scream Factory Collector's Edition Blu-ray. It pairs well with the show if you want to own that too, and they do a bang-up job on all their releases. I know what love is. The sad part of all of this is that this is the last we would hear from anything to do with the franchise. It held the torch for anthology films and then passed it to a handful of 90s movies that varied in quality, before coming back strong in the 21st century. When I was a little girl, this was my favorite book. With Creepshow doing well for Shudder and heading into a fourth season, maybe there's hope that another streaming service will breathe life back into this property. But until then, spread the word and rewatch this absolute classic. Or better yet, show it to a friend. And make sure you show them that damn creepy TV show intro. A dark side. The most important part of your life was the time that you spent with these people.